Do we need to turn it on? OK, it's on. Hello. Oh, this is bright. <coughs> hello, hello, everyone. <coughs> Thanks for attending. Uh, today, my colleague Sergey and I will talk about how you can accelerate the path to cloud native application development. Wow, these lights are really bright. <laughs> so we want this to be interactive, so uh, please uh, feel free to interrupt us if you have any questions. We will try hard to, to see you as you raise your hand. If not, please come forward and we, we, we can talk. You want to drive that or can, I can drive it for you? I'll, I'll do it. Sure. So we, let's talk about how you can start coding um, in two e easy steps using Project Caspian. Now, before any of you raise your hands, let me ask the question, what is Project Caspian? Uh, Project Caspian is a code name for a product that we're launching at EMC World next week. It's an, it's an OpenStack and Pivotal Cloud Foundry-based cloud platform that you can just roll into your data center and start using. It comes with all the hardware and software components, the servers, the storage, the network, and all the other software components like you know, load balancers and networking and Ansible for configuration management and you know, HA proxy, Nginx, etcd, the whole deal, so that you can get up and running and start coding really quickly. Now, setting up OpenStack is painful. Um, setting up Pivotal Cloud Foundry is painful. But setting up OpenStack and Pivotal Cloud Foundry in a manner so that it is production ready, so that it can be upgraded maybe once or twice a year, so that it can be supported, you can maintain it, you can troubleshoot it, so that it is available and stable is much, much, much harder. And that's the problem we're trying to solve. Quite frankly, the deployment problem of OpenStack is kind of solved. You have tons of tools out there that already do that. This is more than deployment, right? This is how you can support it, operate it, upgrade it, troubleshoot it in, in, a, in an easy fashion. So to, to summarize, Project Caspian uh, comes with hardware, software, servers, switches, racks, everything all rolled into one. It's supposed to just work out of the box. And if you think of uh, solutions from, on a scale of uh, sim from simplicity at one end to flexibility on the other, other end, uh, Project Caspian gives you a whole lot of simplicity at the cost of some amount of flexibility. Somewhat like an iPhone, uh, really, really easy to use but not that many configuration options. Now, while the hardware is EMC provided, and quite frankly, hardware is the least interesting part of the solution, it is commodity hardware. Commodity servers, switches, direct attached storage. And we require EMC provided hardware because if we own the full stack, uh, we can provide the best possible uh, customer experience, right from deployment to operations, to support through upgrades. And, <clears throat> and, 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 and really, uh, what, what we've tried, tried, tried to do here is take in those parts of OpenStack and Pivotal Cloud Foundry that, that are really hard to, to, to get working and package all these tools together so that it's just very easy to use. So two easy steps, deploy OpenStack, deploy Cloud Foundry, and you're ready to go. Once you've done these two steps, you can start doing your, your CF push and start scaling your applications, and you're, you're all set. I'll talk about the OpenStack deployment side. Um, my, my friend and colleague, Sergey, will talk about the Cloud Foundry uh, deployment side. So OpenStack deployment has got really three subparts, but the first two are really professional services enabled. So as a customer, you never have to deal with these first two steps. The first is the hardware configuration, where our professional services uh, come in, and it takes uh, le about a day to perform all the three steps. So it's le about one calendar day, really. The, in the hardware configuration, we, we set up things like um, the host IP addresses. Uh, we, we hook up our, our switches to uh, the, the customer switches. Uh, we set up whether we use you know, BGP or static routes for networking. Uh, we, we set up, uh, point our, our servers to the DNS server in your environment, the NTP servers in the environment, just getting it set up. And after that, we have an infrastructure installation um, <clears throat> step where we set up a management complex, our, 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 management, our management plane, which hosts 
the management components for uh, Project Caspian. So I, 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 I UI software, I load balancers, and all the tools that go into really getting that cloud platform ready. And finally, we have the OpenStack installation, which is something the customer will do. That's the first step the customer actually deals with, with uh, Project Caspian. So after one day, one calendar day, the customer is ready to deploy OpenStack, and then after deploy Cloud Foundry on top of it, and then customers have a really cool cloud-native platform. They can use OpenStack directly for running applications on, on it, um, or they can use and or they could use Pivotal Cloud Foundry in conjunction with that to host applications on it. And that's a really powerful cloud, cloud platform. So here's the first screen that a customer gets to see with Project Caspian. And the, the user in this case is a cloud operator who is uh, setting up the cloud so that it can be consumed by the end users, application developers. Think of the business units, or maybe different companies if you're a service provider. At this point, we have one user that's already been created in a local uh, database, the, the cloud operator's username, which is what uh, is used to log in. And this is a single point of control for management, maintenance, <coughs> upgrades, and monitoring and reporting, the backend operations. Now, I should call out that the end user application developer interfaces are 100% OpenStack and Pivotal Cloud Foundry compatible. So the standard horizon interface, the, the OpenStack clients, the OpenStack SDK will work as is. And that is 100% compatible with what's already out there. We, we don't intend to mess with any of that. And our goal is to ensure that developers have an open source industry standard interface for application development. So tomorrow, if they decide to move away from Project Caspian, any investment they've made in application development still holds. They could potentially run those apps on another cloud, another open, OpenStack cloud. Or if they're using libraries like Fog or JCloud, if they work with other, um, other public clouds or other clouds, they could work with that as well. So the end user application development interface is 100% open source, OpenStack, Pivotal Cloud Foundry compatible. What you're seeing here is the back end operator interface to manage Project Caspian, to upgrade Project Caspian, to, to how do you monitor, how do you troubleshoot, how do you report on it? That's what you're seeing here. So after you log in, this is the first screen uh, you get to see. Uh, as you can see, this is a 20-node system. And let me highlight some of these. Um, before that, on the left-hand side, we have our, our pane to, to perform management operations, create accounts, look at the infrastructure, how you can report on it, how you change the settings. And here I'll highlight we have um, a 20 node system out of which three have been used for uh, management nodes, the host and management complex, and the re remaining 17 nodes are, are uh, already available. So as soon as this comes up, it already discovered what's already out there. You, you get a, a, a view of your system. So Let's see, now the next step you may want to do is, out of these 20 nodes, the cloud operator may want to provision a subset of those nodes for OpenStack, or what we call the cloud compute service. So all the customer needs to do, literally, is select the nodes and click a button to deploy, and that's it. In, in 30 minutes, you have four uh, cloud compute nodes ready to, to run your workloads. So let's see how that is. Over here, you see you get to see the list of all the nodes that, that have already been uh, set up. You will find the three of them are the platform nodes that were set up uh, when Project Caspian was set up. And the rest of the nodes are available. <clears throat> now, at this point, I should call out here that these three platform nodes that you're seeing are a very low management footprint for a production-ready, scalable, OpenStack cloud. If you compare this with the management overhead of other products out there, you'll find they have about five nodes or seven nodes. And we have three management nodes for two racks. That's what we've tested. Two racks are about uh, 84, 84 nodes. And even if we scale more than two racks, um, we believe we, we won't need to expand our management, management plane. Three nodes are enough to handle it. Now, the reason why we have three nodes and not more than three nodes is one, one main reason is we use a scale IO for, for block storage. And since scale IO has a very low overhead, it can run hyperconverged on the compute nodes. So the scale IO components, SDC and SDS, if you're familiar with that, they run on the compute nodes. So you do not need a separate pool of compute nodes to provide block storage. 
that's the key benefit of using Scale.io in addition to other features like performance and all the other cool stuff. But that benefit allows us to have a very small management plane. And we use Scale.io not just for Cinder persistent storage, which is the common case, but we also use it for ephemeral storage. So we have this one common pool of storage spread across all the compute nodes that can provide both ephemeral and Cinder persistent block storage. And that allows us to have a very small management plane. Lesser management nodes is good, because that way you have more nodes to run actual workloads. So a starter configuration is eight nodes. Out of, that's the minimum configuration you have. Out of which three are management nodes, five are, are, are available to, to run workloads. Three nodes are there because each service runs in active-active mode, front-ended by three load balancers. So we have like three, three copies of uh, the Nova scheduler running, three copies of MySQL running, so that we can tolerate uh, node failures. And then, of course, we have three load balancers in front as well. That, that are being used to route the traffic across the nodes. So let's get back to <clears throat> the installation part. The goal is to deploy the cloud compute service. So you go to, go to manage, and you click add to service. And now you see the nodes that are available. In this case, I've, I've highlighted the four nodes in which I want to deploy the cloud compute service. You select them, I've selected them. That's why they're highlighted here. So as you can see, and I hit the, the deploy button, and that's it. Uh, we have a fully production-ready uh, OpenStack environment ready for writing applications. You can you know, run your heat on it. You can spin up VMs. You can provision storage. You can take snapshots. You can do all the cool things you do with, with OpenStack. So in one calendar day, uh, you've got a production-ready OpenStack environment ready right from the time it got into your data center. Because when it comes to the, the servers and switches and storage are all, all hooked up, and in one calendar day, you have a production-ready OpenStack environment available, which can be maintained, which you can upgrade once or twice a year, which is easy to troubleshoot, which is easy to support. You just call EMC, and we'll take care of it. And, and that's a really, really cool thing. <clears throat> so here I just want to highlight the, the standard OpenStack operations. This, this is nothing unique over here. We do, do not want this to be unique. We want this to be 100% compatible with OpenStack. But so this is just to highlight. You can do the very the, the basic things that you can do with OpenStack. You can spin up a VM. You can attach floating IP addresses. During our initial uh, setup time, we uh, we we took the floating IP block from the customer. They give us a floating IP block that we could use. We we create our, our, our routers and networks and attach the interfaces. Create the subnets. So hook everything up, and you can directly associate a floating IP address and then attach a floating IP address to an instance. It just works out of the box. Maybe this, this may be a good time to talk a little bit about uh, networking. Um, so all the value of Project Caspian is in software. Uh, we have software-based storage with Scale.io. We have a software-defined networking. We use OpenB switch with Neutron, uh, which, as you know, is vendor neutral. We use VXLANs for the logical network. So when you, as an end user, goes into a project and creates a network and creates a subnet, we use VXLANs to have logical networks so you can have overlapping Amazon Web Services, VPC-style logical networks. And they provide the maximum flexibility. Now, internally in Neutrino, we use, uh, we use layer 3 networking. So we get to use features like OSPF and ECMP. OSPF is a key, is a key component of Neutrino's availabil of, uh, uh, availability and resiliency. Because as nodes go down, OSPF allows the traffic to be routed to, to the right, right location. And, and, that, and that's really important, because failures do happen. This is commodity hardware. Right? No, the application has to be written with the assumption that nodes are going to go down. But at the back end, uh, we make sure that uh, we, we detect that and the, the traffic is routed dynamically to, to the right place. And then we have storage over here, where um, we talked about Scale.io. We use Scale.io internally. And one benefit of using Scale.io for ephemeral storage or ephemeral volumes is that it makes uh, recovery from node failures and live migration really easy. Because if a node goes down, all you need to do is spin up a VM on another physical node, and that node can access the shared volume, and you're, and you're ready to go. And here's an example of how you can launch an application using heat. This is, again, a, a standard interface to, to set up a heat stack. The, the, the reason we are showing that here is that we believe that if, you develop, if you're designing a cloud-native application, you split up this you know, big application into small microservices, 
Uh, some microservices are, are more suited to run directly in, in an infrastructure as a service environment, maybe in containers you're using Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or something directly because you want more customization. Uh, some microservices are well suited to run in a PaaS environment. Um, and, it's, and over here with Project Caspian, you can have both these, um, you have an infrastructure as a service environment available, that's what's OpenStack, we have a PaaS environment that Sergey will talk about, and you can have applications in both these environments communicating with each other, which is a, re a really common, common use case. Now from, I'll, I'll focus just a little bit on, on the operation side of things. Um, so here you can see we have um, all, all the nodes, and let's look at common operations. Let's say a node goes down, you may have to replace it. So you, all you need to do is click on the particular actions button, and you have options to suspend the node, or reboot the node, or uh, reset the node. But there's one operation I really want to talk about is this transfer node. And there are two use cases, two common use cases. Let's take one where your, your management node goes down. Actually, let's take another one. Let's say your compute node goes down. So it ha it's going to happen. But that's not a big deal, because your application is cloud native. It's supposed to deal with a failure, right? It's either using heat, or it's using you know, some kind of auto scaling, or it's, it's handling it itself. So our control plane is always available. It can start up a new VM. No big deal. The node still has to be replaced. You, know, you can suspend the services on, on the node. We can replace it. We'll automatically discover it. Great. But what if your management, one, of, one node of the management plane goes down? Right? That, that's a bigger problem. The neutrino uh, it still continues to run. Project Caspian will still be running, but now you have just two management management nodes, and soon you need to uh, spin up another management node. Now all you need to do as a user is click on the transfer transfer button over here, and you select an available node, and that's it, and and, and you're ready to go. You have a new management node ready. Think how hard this would be if this were to be done manually. You would have to provision a new node, set it up. Uh, make sure it advertises its IP address, manually move the services over. Uh, that could be very error-prone, very time-consuming. Over here, with the press of a button, with no disruption to end-user workloads, you have a brand new management node available. Let me show you the workflow. Over here, you can see you, you select a node, the destination node, where you want to move the, uh, where you want to create a new management node, and you hit transfer. That's it. And another very common use case is uh, when, you, when you scale Project Caspian. Let's say you start off with um, a single rack, maybe half a rack configuration. In that case, your three management nodes are in that half rack. Right? There's, there's only one rack, so you can, that's the only place you can put it. But now let's say you scale up to another rack. Now you want to redistribute your management plane across two racks for, for high availability, because let's say if one rack goes down. So now you need to move your three management nodes from rack one across rack one and rack two for high availability. That's where you could use transfer node again. You just select a node from another rack, click a button, and you're done. And you, you, you get HA because now your, your nodes are redistributed across the different racks. I think how painful this would be to do it manually without any disruption to end user workloads. Right? Really, really hard to do. And, and this goes back to what I said earlier. Setting up OpenStack is one, one part of the deal. Right? That, that's really not the most important thing. There are many tools to do that. But setting up OpenStack so that you can continuously maintain it, you can perform these kind of operations as you scale, how do you expand your management plane, how do you replace management nodes, these are the operations that really take up a lot of time. These are the operations that cause application disruption. And that's what we've tried to solve over here with Project Caspian. Over here, I just want to highlight the, the different components that, that go into into Project Caspian, so you can see you have a, a, a full list of, of components over here. Um, and there are two types of components. We have the platform components, and we have the cloud compute uh, service-specific components. Project Caspian was designed to be multi-service, so all those components that are applicable to all the services are come under the platform component. So our Ansible for configuration management, our Elk stack for log analysis, our load balancers, HAProxy, Nginx, all of these are the common components that are shown over here. And you can see we have uh, three copies of them running all in active-active mode. So you can see we have three copies of HAProxy that we use for TCP-based uh, uh, load balancing. We use Nginx for HTTP, HTTPS-based load balancing. And we have, an, as an example, we have my, use MySQL with the uh, Galera replication. So three of them, they're all running active-active um, so that if, if one node goes down, the, the system continues to run. And you can see that over here. 
the next example over here is for cloud compute. As you can see, we have our uh, Nova controller uh, running in, in active, active mode. Same for other services as well. The, what I want to highlight here is an, another key value prop is we use containers internally to deploy all the components, not just OpenStack services, but all the components in Project Caspian. And the reason we do this is because all these components, you know, HAProxy, Nginx, etcd, the OpenStack services, uh, Ansible, all of these have very different operating environments, own dependencies and runtime libraries, their own quirks, and deploying them and running them in containers makes it really, really easy to isolate them, maintain them, uh, and support them. And if you want to expand a service or you want to add new services, all you need to do is uh, wipe out the existing containers and replace them with new ones. So as you can see, uh, Project Caspian was designed with containers in mind from the ground up. And containers play a key role in making it stable, reliable, and easy to use from an operator standpoint. And now that you have a cloud um, production grade OpenStack environment ready, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Sergey, who will talk about uh, deploying Cloud Foundry on top of it. Thank you, Ajay. Appreciate it. Yes, please. Sure. So let me repeat your question. The question is, it'll be good to, for, for me to share what, what hardware configuration options are available. So we have, uh, we have different hardware configuration options available. Uh, from from server standpoint, they go from 12 core, 16 core, 20 core servers with uh, 400 gigab uh, gigabyte SSD to 800 gigabyte SSD drives for each server. So depending on your use case, you can select the type of hardware configuration you need. And with, with each release, we add additional hardware configurations. So you have a menu item to choose from. And the way, the way you will really work that out is you'll, you'll know how many VMs you want to run. You'll know what your oversubscription ratio you, you want to handle based off your workloads. You back calculate that, and you figure out how many physical servers you want. If you're doing from the public Cloud Foundry side, you'll start with the application instances, backtrack to the number of physical nodes. Thank you, Ajay. Appreciate it. So uh, the native hybrid cloud solution um, idea was to use the project Caspian as a sort of a black box that introduces a cloud native infrastructure and then build on top of that to enable uh, pivotal cloud foundry uh, deployment in a matter of hours, uh, probably within one, within one day to uh, quickly enable developers and DevOps practitioners to start coding in a matter of days. Um, as a solution, cloud, uh, native hybrid cloud treats uh, Project Caspian as, a, in essence, a black box. However, uh, in talking to our pivotal colleagues or in talking to customers such as yourselves, we realize that the majority of the time spent bringing up Pivotal Cloud Foundry in a typical IT infrastructure really spent on analyzing the network and the configuration settings required to correctly provision the Cloud Foundry in identifying the endpoints and integration endpoints with identity providers such as LDAP and AD with the DNS network settings and all that. Um, building that on top of a Project Caspian enabled us to actually retrieve all the settings and configurations automatically, significantly in speeding up the deployment process. So the modern developer solution really builds on top of a Project Caspian by introducing Pivotal Cloud Foundry as a cloud native application development platform. On top of that, a multitude of different services can be used uh, to really build a, again, modern-day DevOps ecosystem. So uh, some of the services, and I'm not sure how well you can see that on the screen, but um, as you know, uh, Pivotal offers the number of uh, marketplace services for integration into DevOps process, such as uh, Jenkins for CI/CD, um, different tools for application performance management, uh, tools for monitoring and reporting. And we've integrated some of these tools into our solution right off the bat. So uh, to spend just a, a few seconds on a description of what is the Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, there are two different approaches to building a, a modern DevOps uh, infrastructure or uh, platform. Uh, one of them is the unstructured approach. The other one is a structured approach. Unstructured approach could be 
um, illustrated by taking uh, different components of the infrastructure, adding on top of a different development tools, integrating it all at the customer side. Um, typically, that is a very time consuming and costly approach, especially for the customers that are, uh, don't, for, for whom the platform is not necessarily their business. Um, a part of that, the structured approach that Pivotal Cloud Foundry introduces uh, brings together all the components required for quick uh, deployment of a platform as a service and enabling developers to start coding pretty much right away. So in essence, Pivotal Cloud Foundry offers the a native platform for cloud native applications and immediately delivers the reach operator experience both for, for the developers as well as development managers and uh, uh, platform admins. Um, the Cloud Foundry itself is an open source project. Um, Pivotal has taken this uh, open source project and built an ecosystem around it with the support services, with the deployment services, with um, incorporating that in the deployment tools that actually uh, enable developers to start coding very quickly. Um, the majority of the operations that Cloud Foundry allows are done through the set of RESTful APIs. Um, the applications themselves are run in the containers that are pre presented to the developers simply as a, an organizational workspace. And then, of course, the, uh, it allows the uh, seamless scaling up or scaling out of uh, multiple applications, either by increasing the application footprint in terms of the memory or disk uh, space uh, required, or increasing the number of running instances of an application. At the same time, that takes care of the, not only scalability, but also resiliency of the application deployment. Uh, as you're running multiple instances of uh, the same application across the entire platform, uh, across the, the project Caspian infrastructure, your application is protected from downtime by a number of instances of the same application running in the different containers, in the different VMs, on the different nodes, across the different racks. So by using the cloud, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, a resilience approach, we um, solve the problem while well, application, pretty much 100% application uptime. It also enables a, a seamless upgrade of the application code. Developers can push the new code uh, without necessarily uh, introducing a uh, downtime in application availability to their end users and customers. Let me go through some of the animations here. So um, the native hybrid cloud tools that we've developed on top of the Project Caspian are designed to be installed at the customer side by professional services, uh, specifically EMC professional services, which also uh, facilitates a handoff to EMC support and enables you to simply pick up a phone and call one number for uh, all associated issues, whether it's the issue related to Cloud Foundry itself or to the networking, to the hardware, or to the Project Caspian underlying infrastructure. Uh, what we've done is we developed a components that Pivotal deployment requires for successful operation. Specifically, as AJ mentioned earlier, the scale I.O. is an underlying layer of persistent storage in the Project Caspian, and it is, uh, acts as both ephemeral and a, a cinder block storage. Uh, we've taken it a step further. We developed a um, S3 compatible Swift cluster that runs on top of uh, Project Caspian, on top of uh, scale I.O. storage and acts as a re uh, resilient and highly available blob store for uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And that's where all the application data is stored. Uh, the application data, the build box, application code, the droplets, et cetera. Uh, we've developed a, an installation tool that is uh, delivered to our professional services as a, a, a virtual machine image that simply gets imported into a Glance and then uh, spun up as a, a VM instance on top of Project Caspian in a, one of the tenants. And uh, then it allows to run through a, set, a series of pre-checks. These pre-checks reach out to the underlying infrastructure and retrieve the associated network information at the NTP, DNS, and the load balancer configuration and enable the configuration of um, a subsequent deployment of Pivotal Cloud Foundry. The three main components of the Pivotal Cloud Foundry that are part of the solution and that enable, of course, the further development are the Pivotal Apps Manager, which then spins up a um, Elastic Runtime. In fact, Elastic Runtime is the Cloud Foundry uh, itself, the open source Cloud Foundry. And then on top of that, we're adding a, another component called uh, Pivotal Apps Metrics, 
which is used for a real-time and historical data collection, monitoring and reporting on uh, the state of health of uh, Cloud Foundry itself. That component is also used to collect a logging data. So we retrieve all the logs from not only Pivotal Cloud Foundry, but also from the Blob Store itself and from all the uh, associated miscellaneous components to make sure that as a platform admin, um, you will have access to logs over time and be able to analyze these logs um, both historically and in real time. The installation itself is pretty straightforward. Uh, once the Project Caspian system is deployed on site, uh, the same deployment engineer retrieves the image of uh, native hybrid cloud deployment VM and then from there uh, proceeds to verify the LDAP configuration, the connectivity to the external log system, uh, firewall and load balancer configuration, NTP server configuration, et cetera, to ensure that once the Cloud Foundry is up and running, all these components are um, accessible. We also look at the footprint um, of, the, of the tenant, whether there are enough resources available for deployment of the Cloud Foundry, given uh, uh, sizing information collected from the customer when uh, the sizing calculations are performed, um, calculating back down from the number of application instances and size of the applications to the number of uh, execution agents, such as the Diego cells, and uh, ultimately down to the number of VMs or to the uh, CPU cores, memory footprint, and disk footprint. So all these calculations are done um, during the deployment by the tool and uh, compared to the resources available in the tenant. If any of the resources are falling short, the tool will inform the, deploy, uh, the installer engineer to go and adjust appropriate quotas in, uh, through Horizon or through the API um, in uh, Caspian project. Um, as, a, as itself, the native hybrid cloud lives in the tenant namespace on top of the project Caspian. Um, it uses the standard OpenStack APIs to authenticate a keystone, to interact with Nova, Cinder, and Neutron, to create, um, ver uh, to create VM instances, assign the uh, private and floating IP addresses to these instances, interacts with the Cinder to create uh, and attach volumes uh, to those VMs, and uh, create the snapshots and then convert them into uh, volumes for a backup and data protection. Uh, at the same time, the installation tool collects all uh, OpenStack-related information, such as the network instance IDs, um, the API endpoints for Keystone, Cinder, Neutron, and uh, Nova, um, and then imports that information into a configuration file that is used by Pivotal Cloud Foundry deployment. Once the deployment is complete, we protect the installed configuration by taking immediate snapshots of all the configurations. So we back up the native hybrid cloud components such as a Swift cluster, such as installation VM, a monitoring and reporting VM, as well as the, um, some of the compo uh, installation settings from Cloud Foundry itself by exporting it into the manifest file that's stored locally. Um, and after the backup, we continue monitoring both the Cloud Foundry itself and um, underlying components in real time, as well as collecting this data historically. These data are presented in a series of reports uh, with associated alerts on the threshold violations, for example, or on uh, uh, any of the operational thresholds breaches from um, Cloud Foundry. We look at not only the state of health of the Pivotal Cloud Foundry, as well as uh, the operational components and operational metrics, such as the number of um, Diego cells available or number of containers available for application deployment. In terms of the data protection, I already mentioned the initial backup of uh, both the Pivotal Cloud Foundry and um, native hybrid cloud components, but at the same time, we continue taking the snapshots over time um, on the user-defined schedule. During the deployment process, we actually offer um, flexibility to enter a specified backup schedule, whether it's 6, 12, or 24 hours, and uh, these snapshots are taken over time and stored um, in the scale IO. Uh, persistent data layer. Um, once, if the failure happens, the uh, customer will have the ability to actually restore 
a, um, either a S3 compatible blob store or any of the components of Pivotal Cloud Foundry from the backup with a today manual procedure, we're actually looking to automate it in the next release. Um, however, all the procedures are well documented and pretty straightforward. It really um, consists of uh, spinning up another instance of the VM from a, uh, from a snapshot, from backup, and then reattaching an existing volume since the volume protected by the scale I.O. persistent storage layer. Um, monitoring and reporting component of native hybrid cloud is really a single point of um, a single place of uh, data collection, reporting, monitoring, and alerting. It provides not only uh, runtime reports on a state of health of individual virtual machines comprising the Cloud Foundry, but also historical information uh, that covers um, Cloud Foundry components themselves, as well as the uh, applica uh, application developers' activity in the Cloud Foundry. So we monitor the applications and application instances as uh, they're being published in the Cloud Foundry. We collect their footprint information over time. We record the number of instances of each application, number of service instances. And from there, begin to uh, generate the reports. These reports are available either through the user interface or could be exported in the uh, uh, form of a web page, the PDF or Excel files, et cetera. In addition to the operational reporting, we provide a financial insight that really looks at the showback information available from Cloud Foundry how much uh, usage hours are uh, generated by each application, each service, and for given organizational, organizational space. Um, we use a couple of uh, mechanisms to collect this data from Cloud Foundry. Uh, JMX uh, provider is a native component of uh, Pivotal Apps Metrics. We use that as well uh, as the set of API calls directly to the Cloud Foundry to collect the data from application layer. And from a uh, logging standpoint, we built in an open source Elk stack component that uh, retrieves the logs from both uh, native hybrid cloud components and the Cloud Foundry components into a log analysis platform. That log analysis platform is available as a part of the solution, but at the same time offers uh, customers ability to export the log in real time to a log analysis, um, external log analysis tools such as Splunk and others. In addition to the logging itself, we provide a set of dashboards that uh, at a glance display the performance of uh, native hybrid cloud, the Pivotal Cloud Foundry components, as well as alerts uh, that exist in the system. Um, each of these dashboards is available for drill down for more detailed information uh, for administration, support, and troubleshooting purposes. Um, and the as I mentioned, the chargeback or showback, really depending on the um, terminology used in your organization, offers the ability to, uh, for business units to, dis, uh, to understand uh, in greater level of details exactly how they're using underlying infrastructure. We're actually um, using that for uh, some of the service provider functions as well because this information could be easily filtered and uh, extracted for a given tenant or a, a given development um, department and provide it to managers or the financial administrators to understand how they should plan the development capacity going forward. So with that, um, it's time for questions. No? Okay, if there's no more questions, then we'll proceed with the raffle. All right, so we're ruffling out Amazon Echo. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a lucky person here in the room. And the lucky winner is 970-377. There we go, we have a winner. 